I'd like to welcome each and every one of you tonight in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in him that we live and that we move and we have our very being. Tonight, uh, the subject, the theme that we will be contemplating and sharing is brokenness leads to complete dependence upon Christ. The uh, call to worship tonight I've taken from Psalms 34. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. And I don't usually talk about the scripture too much that I share in a call to worship, but I feel a little differently about that tonight. So I'd like to share a little bit of you with you from this book, From Brokenness to Community, by a gentleman named Jean Vanier. And this book was given to me, gosh, probably about 2008, I think, uh, by uh, High Priest uh, Jim Gates. And I must have read this book now 20 times. And each time that, that I read it, it touches my soul. And uh, Jean Vanier, uh, grew up in uh, Toronto, Canada, and went to school in England. And uh, when he lived in France, he uh, invited a couple of disabled young men to come and live in his home. And from that, uh, a community started called the Arche, or in English, the Ark. And from that time, 99 such communities have been developed around the world, devoted to recognizing and nurturing the dignity of the disabled. And they sprung up in 24 different countries. And there's a story in here of a gathering that they had of a few of the communities that came together inviting the parents and uh, the young children and uh, the folks that lived in the community. And uh, they invited uh, some bishops to come to that event. And that's what you have in front of you tonight. So it kind of caught my eye when I first read this. <clears throat> but it speaks of one of the uh, young men, disabled men. Armando cannot walk or talk and is very small for his age. He came to us from an orphanage where he had been abandoned. He no longer wanted to eat because he no longer wanted to live, cast off by his mother. He was desperately thin and dying for lack of food. After a while in our community, where he found people who held him, who loved him and wanted him to live, he gradually began to eat again and to develop in a remarkable way. He still cannot walk or talk or eat by himself. His body is twisted and broken and he has severe mental disabilities. But when you pick him up, his eyes and his old body quiver with joy and excitement, which says, I love you. He has a deep therapeutic influence on people. I asked one of the bishops, if he wanted to hold Armando in his arms, and he did. I watched the two of them together as Armando settled into his arms and started to quiver and smile, his little eyes shining. A half hour later, I came to see if the bishop wanted me to take Armando. No, no, he replied. I could see that Armando in all his littleness, but with all the power of love in his heart, was touching and changing the heart of that bishop. Bishops are busy men. They have power and they frequently suffer acts of aggression. So they have to create solid defense mechanisms. But someone like Armando... With all the power of love in his heart. I hurt myself. But someone like Armando can penetrate the barriers they and all of us 
create around our hearts. Armando can awaken us to the love and call forth the well of living waters and tenderness hidden inside each one of us. Armando is not threatening. He just says, I love you and I love being with you. And the author goes on to explain that in each one of these communities, they have volunteers that come and live in the community to take care of these disabled folks. And what they find is that the ones that come to help are the ones that are helped the most because they begin to recognize their own brokenness and their own hardness. And they're molted and molded and melted by the love of those who are broken and tender hearted. And so when I read this scripture, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. My heart is taken to Armando and that bishop. And Ralph can attest to this. He and I went to India and I had a very similar experience in India. One night uh, we were up on a rooftop, Ralph, if you remember, and they were trying to get the lights that were strung up on strings to work and they kept going out and they couldn't get the generator to work. And so we were sitting there waiting for that to be accomplished. And there was this mother with this young child, this little girl, and she came and she sat that little girl on my lap. And in that half an hour that I sat with her in my lap, my heart was melted with a love and a penetration of the love of God that has stayed with me even to this hour. And when it came time to start the service, the mother came and asked me if I could take that little girl home to America where she could have a life that she could never have in India. And I thought, what kind of love can a mother have for a child? that she would be willing to sacrifice her own desires and needs for the benefit of her child. And I realized that my understanding of God and his great love was pretty shallow. And that he has much greater love in store for each one of us in his kingdom. And that's what he calls us to. That's what his kingdom is about, is his love, his hope, and his truth. So let us continue in our service tonight. We'll sing hymn number 220. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. For it's that well of living waters that wells up within each one of us, that Holy Spirit that bears witness to the truth and the love of God. And we'll stand for this hymn and remain standing uh, for the invocation by Bishop Andrew Romer.
eternal Heavenly Father. Lord, we come to you this evening as a broken people, with broken hearts and contrite spirits, knowing that you are the giver of all that is good, and we are but dross. Lord, I pray tonight that your spirit would be with us, that each one here might be lifted to the mountaintop and might feel the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we might know that we are loved and that our worship for you might be worthy in your eyes. And this I pray in Jesus Christ's most holy name. Amen. Before I start with my offertory remarks, I'd like to uh, do some housekeeping here uh, about our budget. A budget for the conference is $5,000. Uh, last night, the offering was $305, and there'll be two more times besides tonight to give, give. So I want just, that's just for your information. I recently read a, a survey on Christian giving and discovered in this article there were three levels of giving. Less than our ability, according to our ability, and beyond our ability. The less than our ability, 96% of the people, that's what they answered. According to their ability, 3%. And beyond their ability, 1%. It is telling us that it is the calling of the office of bishop to encourage giving. Why? Do you think God needs our money? No, he needs our hearts. There is so much more to it. And Paul told Timothy, for it is the love of money that is uh, the root of all evil. And in the Greek translation, that evil is evil. So the love of money is the root of every evil that there is. God is interested in where our treasure lies and where our heart is. And I'm convinced that the way we handle our earthly resources has a direct and important connection with our eternal life. This is and should be on the hearts and prayers of every bishop, and I know it is. I know every bishop goes to bed every night worrying about this. It is less, is it less than our ability, or is it according to our ability, or is it beyond our ability? And when I pass on to my next life, I'd like to meet that widow who gave all that she had in the temple that day because I want to know the rest of the story because I know she was blessed. If not earthly blessed, eternally she was blessed. We have the written record of true groups of people who lived on this land They did not understand that righteousness brings prosperity and prosperity leads to pride and pride leads to destruction. The Jaredites and the Nephites are clearly our example of what can happen to a nation of people. We live on this same land and we need to ask ourselves, where is our nation? And the only answer is to keep the covenant. Keep the financial law. Would the brothers come forward and wait upon you for the offering now? You better wait upon us.
our loving Heavenly Father, we would ask a blessing upon this offering. May you bless it and multiply it as you did with the loaves and fishes. May we as your children experiment on your word. May we not just give away what we consider luxuries, but experiment on giving beyond our abilities. May we learn to come before you as the poor widow, that we'd learn the meaning of sacrifice. Just as those early Israelites had to learn complete trust in you to provide for them, and by so doing were allowed to enter into that promised land, may we do likewise and enter into your kingdom, even Zion. Amen. I bring you greetings this evening from the saints in southern Indiana. They send their love and greetings and look forward tonight to sharing and worship together. And for scripture reading this evening, I have taken from our revelations, section 167, paragraph 2C, and then also we will be reading from the book of Mosiah. That'll be the first chapter, verses 109 and 116. If you have your scriptures tonight, I'd invite you to open them as we will be uh, journeying through the scriptures as we go through our evening together. If you don't have your our revelations and you don't have section 167, you're in luck because you have it tonight. It hopefully was the handout that was provided to you by our deacons, and if you don't have one of those, then we'll make sure that we get uh, copies of those. Taken from 167, paragraph 2C. This work must be done in humility and meekness. By doing so, you will gain the realization of your brokenness and thus have a greater dependence upon God and Jesus. That brokenness leads to repentance and life-changing actions and thoughts. That dependence upon me will help you and your relationships toward each other and assist you as you grow together as my children. And from the words of King Benjamin in the first chapter of Mosiah, Verse 109 says, And the Lord God hath sent his holy prophets among all the children of men to declare these things to every kindred, nation, and tongue, that thereby whosoever should believe that Christ should come, the same might receive remission of their sins and rejoice with exceedingly great joy, even as though he had already come among them. And from verse 116, And moreover I say unto you, that there shall be no other name given, nor any other way, nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word.
Thank you so much for the beautiful ministry of music this evening. I'd like to begin tonight with a story, a story taken from the life of Simon, later named Peter. As I share the story with you, I will probably find myself going in and out of first person and third person, as I hope that you can bring yourself tonight to the place that Peter was the night that we're about to experience what he was experiencing. It had been a very long night. It was getting very late. It had been a long day, and now it was going on into a very long evening. They had just had the Passover meal together. They had been in the upper room with Jesus and with the others. Jesus had been talking rather cryptically about someone betraying him. Still not sure why Judas left so early. 
And then Jesus took the bread and the wine and he gave it to us, had us take of the fruit of the vine and then said something about it, us not actually having this drink with him again until he comes later. And then he, he washed our feet. I think he overheard us. He always seemed to overhear us. I think he overheard, I think it was John, somebody, it wasn't me, but it was someone who was talking about, you know, who's the greatest, somebody. But I think he overheard us. And so he sat us down and he washed our feet. And then we went out on that familiar walk. He loved to walk. We were singing out to the Mount of Olives and then we made our way to that familiar garden. And then Jesus said something that I don't know. I don't know why he said what he said. I don't. Jesus said unto them that all of ye will be offended because of this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Peter, me, he said to Jesus, although all men shall be offended of thee, yet I will never be offended. And then Jesus looked at me and he said, Verily I say unto thee that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, you shall deny me thrice. But then Peter, he spake even more vehemently, If I could die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And then he turned specifically to Peter and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired you that he might sift the children of the kingdom as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. And then Peter said to Jesus, being aggrieved, Lord, I am ready to go with you both into prison and unto death. So we kind of got that out of the way. It was a little uncomfortable and we kept walking. Still wasn't sure exactly why. But then Jesus asked us to go with him, me and Peter, James and John, the three of us. And he asked us to go a little farther with him to pray. And, and I could tell that there was something weighing on Jesus. The weight of something. But we were also tired. You ever feel that way as I look out upon this group? Oh, it's been a long day, conference, first full day. Whew. I'm tired. Jesus, we've been, we've been singing hymns, we've been praying, we've been conversing. And now you want us to pray again. Well, James and John fell asleep, so I figured it was okay. Just couldn't keep my eyes open. But then, when we woke up, Jesus had come over to us and Judas was back and he wasn't alone. He had brought the officers of Caiaphas and those officers from those Pharisees. They said they'd been looking for Jesus and Judas came over and he kissed Jesus and the guards started to come for him. But no, not on my watch. I pulled out one of the two swords we had brought with us that night. And I think later somebody told me the guy's name was, was Malchus. I don't know, one of the servants of Caiaphas. I swung the sword at him. I cut his ear off. I cut his ear off. But Jesus stopped me. He stopped us all. And he reached up to the man and he healed his ear just like that. And then Jesus said something about how he'd been in the temple all the time. You could have grabbed me any, anywhere, anytime, and yet you've come here tonight under the cloak of darkness. But, but I didn't really catch it all because as I turned around and looked, all of our guys, they started running. So I thought I should probably start running too. And I really thought that Jesus would probably start running as well. But then I turned back and I realized Jesus wasn't running with the rest of us. He was just standing there and they took him 
and they let him take him. So I stopped and I followed them and I took him to Caiaphas' palace. And they were asking him a bunch of questions about what he'd been teaching. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, well, why don't you ask the people I was teaching? You know, they're there here too. Well, he got a smack upside the face for that one. They didn't like that answer that Jesus had given. But I don't know, then a bunch of people started coming in and they started saying a bunch of things that weren't really true. But I could just barely make out exactly what they were saying because I was in the courtyard. I wasn't really in where it was taking place. Oh, what happened next? Well, it's, well, it's kind of hard to talk about still. I, I, well, you see, Peter has a really hard time remembering and recalling what happened next. Let's share together as Luke was sharing this account, just exactly what happened next that night with Peter. And when just outside in this moment, they had kindled a fire out in the hall, Peter sat down with those who were outside Caiaphas' palace. But a certain maid beheld him. And as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him, she said, this man, this man was with him. Peter denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also with them. You were with him. And Peter said, Man, I am not him. And about the space of an hour, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of truth, this man, this Peter, you were definitely with him. You're a Galilean. We can tell by the way you talk. They say about me coming from southern Indiana. I can tell you're from that region. You're a Galilean. I know you were with that Jesus. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately the scripture tells us that while Peter yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And at that moment, Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. And the scripture records for us that in that moment, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Can you imagine that moment? Did you catch that verse? That verse in Luke 22 was verse 61, that after Peter had denied him three times, the Lord turned and saw Peter. Peter looking up from the fire, through the people, through the courtyard, into the palace, outer court. There he saw Jesus looking at him. Looking into his soul, into what he had just done. Realizing what Peter had just done. Denying that he had ever known this Jesus. Can you feel Peter's anguish in that moment? Can you feel his brokenness? Scripture tells us that he went out. He left. I, I, Peter ran to the sepulcher on resurrection morning. I bet he ran out of there. Peter was a little impetuous sometimes, and he was, I bet he got out of there as quick as he could. And the scripture tells us that he wept bitterly in his brokenness. Well, that's Peter's story. I ask you tonight, what's your story? Have you ever wept bitterly? Have you ever felt the pain and the anguish that was so great that your soul just cried out? I remember as a young boy, and the challenge of remembering as a young boy is getting more and more challenging all the time. But I remember as a young boy, my grandfather passed away when I was five. And my grandmother 
uh, was everything to me, was my world at that point in my life. I loved being with her. I loved spending time with her. I had a younger cousin. We were always with her. And after my grandfather passed away, we spent a lot of time with my grandmother. I think I, think I thought I was helping her by you know, being with her after my grandfather passed away. I'm sure it wasn't any trouble at all to have a couple of toddlers running around all the time at her feet. Um, but I remember one night, vividly, specifically, and I'll never forget it. My cousin and I were sleeping, or to be sleeping in one room, and my grandmother was in the other room. And that night, after he had passed, I could hear her. I could hear her pain. I could hear her crying. She really tried to be quiet. She knew we were in the other room. But I could feel and I could hear. And in that moment, as a, as a youngster, I wasn't really sure what to do. But I knew because I had been taught by my parents. My mom took me to vacation Bible school all the time and church school all the time whether I wanted to or not. But I knew I needed to pray for my grandmother. And so as best as I could, I remember praying for her. And in that moment, my grandfather appeared in that room. And I heard him say, it's okay. She's going to be okay. He's going to take care of her. And I remember the next morning talking to my grandma and my cousin. And when I said those words, when I shared with her that grandpa came and he said, you're going to be okay. And you don't have to be sad and it's going to be okay. And they said, he's going to take care of you. I remember my grandmother lighting up and looking at me and saying, Jesus will always take care of us. I also remember experiencing the pain of my wife's pain. That good Friday morning when she found her father unresponsive. Many of you in this room know Wes and know the love that he brought everywhere he went. And on that morning of Good Friday, Rebecca received a call from a friend that was supposed to be meeting her dad, and he didn't show up, which, as everybody knows with Wes, is not terribly uncommon or strange. Wes would get on something and have an appointment and he was already on to something else and he was focusing on whatever that was. And so she was going to head over to check at the house to see if he was there. And I was outside. And I was, I was walking outside. I heard the sirens first. And then I saw the ambulance. And I knew it had to be for Wes. So from our backyard, I sprinted into the house. The phone was already ringing. And I picked up the phone and it was Rebecca. And I could feel that pain and that anguish. And, and the brokenness during the moments that followed. I know each of you have had a moment like that or maybe multiple moments like that in your life. And as my grandfather used to say, if, if you haven't yet, you just haven't lived long enough because you will. Congratulations. It's in those moments, the only thing we can do is to cry out to our God. And it's in those moments of brokenness that we're brought to a realization that we have nothing apart from God. I share these stories with you to bring you to a place, hopefully where 
together we see that we need to be broken. We need to move ourselves to a place of humility and brokenness, but, but, just as we see in Peter's story, Jesus did not leave Peter to remain in that state of brokenness. Is it any wonder that those three, I would say short days, but I'm sure for the disciples and those that followed Jesus after his crucifixion, I'm sure it was three long days. That morning when the women came back from the sepulcher and they said, you're not going to believe this. And they're like, we don't believe that. There's no way. You saw an angel. He wasn't in the tomb. As I said before, I kind of gave it away. What did Peter do? Took off running. Now, John's gospel says, I actually outran Peter, but I let him go in first because that's Peter. He always wants to go in first, but he ran to see. Can you imagine what was going through Peter's mind in that moment? The excitement, the possibility, and what about now the fear and the guilt? Could could I have done something different that night? What if I hadn't betrayed him? What if I hadn't denied him? What if I, what if I've just done something, anything, maybe this would have never happened. What was those, what were those moments like for Peter? Was he really alive? Well, you all know the story. He was, he had been risen just as he said, and he comes to his disciples and he comes to Peter to restore Peter, to bring him back into relationship with him, with all of the disciples, bringing them back. But specifically to Peter, we have the account in the Gospel of John, the 21st chapter. We have that interchange, right, that Jesus has with Peter after he brings them in from the boat. They're all gone. You know, Peter, he was like, well, I don't know. I know Jesus has been resurrected. I'm not really sure. And so what, what does Peter say? He says, I'm going to go fishing, guys. Do, do we do that sometimes, right? Do we just kind of go back to what we knew? Like, I mean, we were there. We had a great three-year run with Jesus. And I, I don't know. I guess I know, I know what I know, and I know fishing. So I'm going to go fishing. And the guys went fishing with him, and we know the story. Jesus comes out and, hey, put your net on the other side. Maybe you actually catch something. They come in. He's got the fire set. He's got the meal prepared. And then Jesus brings Peter just a little closer, just a little closer to him. And if I'm Peter, I know what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, man, he's going to ask me about that night. In verse 15, it says, now when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And so Jesus said, Feed my lambs. And he said unto him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. And then Jesus said unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he had said unto him this third time, lovest thou me? And Peter said, Lord, you, you know everything. You know all things. You know in my heart that I love thee. And I could envision the little twinkle in Jesus' eye. I could envision the smile that came across his face and a little nod when he said the third time, feed my sheep. So what was Peter's response after all of that experience? Coming to the realization of his brokenness, having being humbled, having been humbled, and now the change that was once again wrought in his heart, the determination, the opportunity that was now before him. What did he do? Well, of course, they waited the 50 days. They waited until 
the Holy Spirit was going to come. But on that day of Pentecost, the scriptures record for us that it was Peter who stood up and he said, no, 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 these guys aren't crazy. They're not drunk. It's early in the morning. I'm telling you, it's the spirit of the living God. And that's this man, Jesus, whom you all crucified, he's alive. And we're here to tell everybody and we're not going to stop. It was Peter began the mission of fulfilling the call to teach all nations about Jesus Christ, baptizing them. And he went out. It was Peter who through the realization of his brokenness, he was moved to repentance, which led to an even greater change upon his life and the lives of everyone that he encountered. He became that mighty voice bearing witness of the risen Lord. He led many with the authority the priest had given to him from the master to repentance and baptism. He suffered chains. He suffered prison and a martyr's death. But he did so as a witness to the end. That he who called him from those nets to become a fisher of men. He remained faithful to the trust that was given to him and all the apostles to teach nations. And it was Peter, along with James and John, who came back to this earth in this dispensation to restore the holy priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, under which and under that divine authority. And under which that divine authority, the church of Jesus Christ was again organized in these latter days. And under which that same authority exists to this day. We have Peter's own testimony in his second epistle taken in the first chapter. He says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I just love that. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. From there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son. And whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard. We were there, he says. We were on the holy mount with him. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So like Peter, we have the path that leads us to walking in the way with God. We have the path that leads us from our brokenness to repentance and dependence upon Jesus Christ. And tonight, that is what we have joy in our hearts about. And that's what we're going to talk about. And so the experience that Peter had created a change in him and when we have those experiences, when we realize our brokenness, we can experience that same change that will motivate us and inspire us into action. And in, we have the opportunity to impact the world that is around us and the relationships with one another. At least that's the, that's the design, right? That's the aim. That's the goal. That's the hope. And tonight you have the handout from which this scripture was given to us, which the Lord revealed to us through our present prophet Terry Patience as he was called into, into the Lord's service. And I know that each of you have seen, and it's been a couple of years, we had an opportunity to share in my own testimony about this inspired document that was given, how the Lord unfolded to me that indeed it was his, his very signature. But the Lord... was reminding us once again that he's in control. That when we think we've got to do something, sometimes the Lord will help us remember that it's his church, his way, and not ours. And it's the height of hubris. It's the height of pride to think that we have it all figured out when this is the church of Jesus Christ. And he called one to once again lead this church and he gave us this testimony and he gave this, this this example and tonight however in that chiastic structure in those examples that you see if you have the 
the, the front side of the page, which is the entire scripture, flip it over, if you will, because tonight in one of those parallels, it will be the parallel F is the one that we're going to focus on. That's the verse that we read tonight from 167 paragraph 2C. This work being done in humility and meekness. This is the path tonight that I want you to see. And if there's anything tonight that you walk away with, well, it's at least in your hand. If there's anything tonight, and you know, if it's, you can draw on it, you can doodle on it, you can make a note and pass it to your friend, whatever you need to do to stay with me, I encourage you to do so. But the path that leads us to each other, the path that leads us to the kingdom, because leading us to one another and the kingdom is one and the same. The salvation of yours and mine together is the desire and the aim of Almighty God. Bringing us into his kingdom, that is the goal. And we say, when can we have the kingdom? And we say, where is the kingdom? And we say, now, Lord? And the Lord says, I've given you the path. And that realization of our brokenness, just like Peter, He'd been with him for three years. I would say Peter probably had about as good as understanding of the kingdom as anybody was going to have in that moment before Jesus' crucifixion. But something happened after Peter truly was broken. When he came to that realization, you see that the path that the Lord laid out for us, it actually begins with humility and meekness. We've been talking a lot about this realization of our brokenness because that leads to the next five things oh by the way just just a sidebar no extra charge for this when you look at a list of five things it deals with human experience jerry Shear taught me that when you look at this one another one of those hebrewisms right three number of three deals with god four and is man but five is human experience the lord gave us a list of the five things in our experience that will draw us closer to him and he says if you will come to me in humility and we're going to talk a, a lot about that uh oh he said a lot and he's like richard you've already been going for a while don't worry i, I, I promise it will get you out before tomorrow morning's prayer service dennis starts with humility and meekness then the next step in the path it's that humility that leads us to a realization of our brokenness without humility we don't care without the humility we don't know that we even need to be broken. Once we have that realization, that's what leads to repentance. Now's the list of five. Here we go. That's what leads to repentance and our life changing action and thoughts and our dependence upon Christ. And then the Lord went a little further with that dependence upon Christ. And once we are dependent upon him, he says that will help and assist with our relationships toward each other and growing together as children of God. Our human experience that leads us back to God, that leads us to his kingdom. So brokenness, I appreciate so much Brother Kevin's story about Armando tonight as we opened. Brokenness is a growing awareness that no matter how much I try to make my life better, I can't. Brokenness is a result of the Holy Spirit moving us to a place of change. Brokenness is allowing the Holy Spirit to move us to a place of change, but not by our own efforts, because we can't do it apart from him. Brokenness is unleashing our union with Christ. It is our reliance on our flesh, exchanging relying upon me for relying upon God. And the prerequisite, as we see in the path that the Lord laid out for us, a prerequisite to the understanding and realizing that brokenness is humility. So that's really where we need to start. Halfway through, he says, now he's going to begin. This path starts with humility and meekness. C.S. Lewis once wrote, humility is not about thinking less of yourself, but it is about thinking about yourself less. 
catch that? It's not about thinking less of yourself. You're a child of the king. You're a child of almighty God. You're the most precious thing in his creation. But humility is not you thinking how great you are. It is thinking less of yourself and more about your brother and more about your sister. Humility is freedom from pride. It is the awareness of our lowliness compared to God's greatness. And that's what's important when we talk about how low can we go and how high God is. That, that comparativeness is, is important for us to understand. It is the recognition that there is only one who should be exalted. Newsflash, it's not you and it's not me. It is replacing self-centeredness with God-centeredness. And Rebecca knows who I'm about to go to because she knows that I can't not share what King Benjamin had to say about this very topic. We mentioned from King Benjamin earlier tonight, but in Mosiah 2, chapter 20, chapter 2, verse 20, he says, Even so, I would that you should remember and always retain in your remembrance the greatness of God and your own nothingness and his goodness and his long suffering towards you, unworthy creatures. And hear the word that he says, and humble yourselves even in the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily and standing steadfastly in the faith of that which is to come. And behold, I say unto you that if you do this, you shall always rejoice and be filled with the love of God and always retain a remission of your sins. Andrew J. Holmes said, it is well to remember that the entire population of the universe, with only one exception, is composed of others. So maybe the ratio of the time we spend thinking about numero uno and the, and the time we spend thinking about others, maybe there's a mathematical equation in there somewhere. And one of these bishops can help you with math, I hope. Or Dan can I see Dan. So it's also been said being humble means recognizing that we are not on earth to see how important we can become, but to see how much of a difference we can make in someone else's life. So pride then is an opposition to humility. Humility is the opposite of pride. Pride focuses on others failures pride is self-righteousness it's overly critical and fault-finding pride looks down on those who are not quite as spiritual or not quite as committed as we are pride thinks that they know who the truly proud are oh and they know who the humble are it's them of course and it thinks pride also thinks that Everyone is privileged to have them involved. Humility. Humility realizes how far we fall short and how overwhelmingly we need God. The overwhelming sense of our need to grow. Humility is compassionate and forgiving. Humility looks for the best in others. It seeks to win people, not arguments. I'm just thinking about some people in my mind right now whenever I said that out loud, seeking to win the people instead of the arguments. I can think of so many times in my life that I have won so many good arguments, and man, I had good arguments that I won those arguments with. And how far I drove people away. But I won the argument. Humility realizes only God knows a person's true motive, and it leaves the judgment of the heart into God's hands. Alma II had an experience with a group of people as he was going through teaching about Jesus Christ. He had an experience with people who were also struggling with pride. And this morning in our prayer service, Brother Dennis Evans read a scripture from Alma 18 
about a letter or the instruction he was trying to give his son. And it was about this very people, the Zoramites. And in the 16th chapter of Alma is where you find this story. And no, I promise you, I'm not going to read the entirety of the story to you. But what I need you to understand about this experience that Alma has with the Zoramites is this is a group of people who were people of God. They were children of the Most High God. They were Nephites. They were part of the ones who believed. And then someone came along and kind of tried to started to tweak what was the truth to them and started to teach itching things and tried to help them maybe think that um, they were maybe just a little better than the rest of the Nephites. So they started to get slowly and slowly off to themselves, worshiping themselves to the point that the, eventually they didn't even believe in this idea of the Son of God. Eventually the Zoramites said, we don't even believe that this, this Son of God is even going to be a thing, but we will follow the commandments. We will be better than everybody else. And they built this great place where they could pray in their, in their synagogue. A little bit higher than everywhere else they'd go in and they'd pray and they would pray to god and they would tell them they'd thank god how great they were and how it was so wonderful that they were the chosen people this is the zoramites and alma sees this and he thinks to himself oh my goodness these were once our brothers and our sisters and he says but the pride of the people have pulled them so far away so, you know, there's a group of the Zoramites that get kicked out of the synagogue. You remember that part of the story, right? They get kicked out because they weren't really, well, they were a little more poor than the rest of them. They kind of embarrassed the rest of the people. So they kind of got kicked out. So it was those people that come to Alma when Alma comes to town and they say, hey, they kicked us out of the synagogue. And Alma's like, you can just see him inside. He's like, he's like, oh, this is good. This is good. So he says, so. So let me get this straight. You've been kicked out, right? So you got nowhere to know. Yeah, we've got nowhere to nowhere to worship. We've got nowhere to pray. And so Alma says, so you've been humbled, have you? OK, I can work with that. I can work with that. And so Alma and Amulek and the others, they begin to teach and they begin to help this group of people understand that it's never been about them. It's never been about what they thought was so important what they had envisioned in their mind and they brought them to a realization of their own brokenness now the reason alma the second could recognize right this idea of of being brought to humility remember it was alma the second that and i love alma the second if you all don't know i'm richard the second i'm also a second so i think alma second Pretty cool versus Alma the I don't know Alma the first is pretty good too, I guess he's he's good, but Alma understood what it meant to be compelled to be humble because remember Alma the second and his buddies the sons of Mosiah were the ones running around persecuting the church until the angel appears and says what what's going on, and so Alma himself through those days, through those few days where he can't move, can't talk, he then comes to that moment of realization of his brokenness. He comes to himself through the power of Jesus Christ. So he understands why this is so important, and he sees it, and he senses it. Pride, from the very beginning, in the garden, it was pride that began the fall and that created the separation from Adam and Eve from God. And the serpent came to Eve and said, you can be like gods. If you do the thing God said not to do, why don't you just do the thing God said not to do? Why? Because you just want to because you wanted to disobey God. No, he said, because you can become like God. He played on that pridefulness pride is that rebellion against God it causes that separation from God and you remember the story because in that moment that they ate of the apple something happened something changed they realized they were naked they were ashamed and they rent to, and they ran to hide themselves from God do we do that have you done I've done that. 
when we've done something that we know is disobedient, that we, that we realize that we've done something wrong. I know as a small child, I keep going back to that because it's a little more comfortable to talk about when I was a kid than when I talked about last week. So when I was a kid and I did something wrong, I'd run and hide under the bed because I knew something bad was going to happen to me because of what I just done. And so Adam and Eve, they ran, they hid from God. The realization of their sin because of that pride and disobedience, it illustrates to each of us what happens when we yield to sin. And what is that? We want to hide from God. We can't bear to face him. We withdraw ourselves from him. We withdraw ourselves from his direction. We withdraw ourselves from seeking his face. And this is exactly the opposite of what God wants from all of us and for all of us. Humility brings us to the realization of our brokenness and our need for Christ and our need for repentance. And it was after that experience in the garden that we have the very first reference to the word repent. The very first reference to the time of repentance after Jesus closed them and after he takes them out of the garden. What we have to recognize here is that in the fourth chapter of Genesis verses eight and nine, you can go back and read that for your homework assignment, but God's focus of Adam and Eve was not on their sin. God's focus was on the repentance. God's focus was about restoring them to himself by bringing them back into communion with him and redeeming them from the fall. In Genesis chapter five, verse one, it says the Lord God called upon all men. After that happened, he called upon all men everywhere to repent. Ever wonder why in Doctrine and Covenants section 10, right at the beginning of the restoration, the Lord through the prophet said, to this world, section 10, paragraph 4b says, say nothing but repentance to this generation. Remember that? I know you do. Why? Why so much focus on repentance? Is it because God wants us to focus our attention on our sin? I don't believe so. I believe it's just the opposite. I believe it's because God wants us to recognize that it's through repentance that we have that realization of our brokenness. Our need for him comes through repentance. And we can only be brought back to the father through his only begotten son. God wants us to live a forgiven life, to be released from the bondage of sin. He wants us to be free to love him, to be free to commune with him, and guess what? He wants us to be free to love one another and to be in communion with one another and community with one another. In section R168, what just came to us, Jesus, in these words, God gave to us just last year. He said, those who favor Babylon's ways are becoming entrenched in their desires and their beliefs causing them to fall further, further and further away. You sound like pride? Their beliefs, their desires, what I want to do. Babylon's further and further away. But listen to what God says. This saddens my heart, for I do not wish that any should fall away. By the way, that says any, not many. It wasn't that he said, I'd like for not very many of them to fall away. He says, I don't want any of them to be lost. That's where our brokenness comes in. That's where this path that leads us to one another. When we concentrate so much on sin instead of repentance, when we focus our emphasis on the sin, we find ourselves bringing judgment to one another. We find ourselves bringing judgment against each other and wondering, well, their sin's a little worse than mine. I'm not quite that bad. Well, at least I don't do that. The comparisons start. And we become less likely to be able to forgive. Jesus has called us to forgive. 
And the story I will leave you with, whew, they all said collectively, and the story I will leave you with that punctuates that point better than any others, I think, or there's probably other ones and I'm anxious for you to tell me the ones that you love more. But Jesus is outside, he's teaching with his people, and all of a sudden there's a big commotion. And he looks over and he sees these people dragging this woman through the dirt into the middle of where he's teaching. And they throw her down right into the middle of her, into the middle of the group. And they look to Jesus and they say, this woman has done this thing. What do you say? What are you going to do about it? The law says we should do this to her. And Jesus didn't say a word. He just looked down. Stooped down, he started drawing in the dirt. Like my t-ball kids used to do when I was trying to coach them. Wait a minute, Jesus, we caught her in the act. Here she is. There's her sin on display for everyone to see. What are you going to do? He says nothing. And finally, he looks up to them. And he says, anyone here that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And he goes back down and draws in the dirt once more. And he waits a few beats and a few beats more. I can envision him just smiling and waiting. I can envision as you look down, seeing he probably is seeing the, the feet that are just leaving, just dispersing from the circle until he realizes there's no one left but him and her. And he looks at her and he says, where's your accusers? Where are they? Where they've all gone? Is there anyone here left to accuse you? And she says, no, Lord. And you know his response. Neither do I condemn thee. Now go and sin no more. It is her heart and the repentance and the change that is wrought that Jesus is calling us to live with and to be those kinds of people. Let us choose humility. Let us allow the realization of our brokenness to lead us to repentance, to lead us to dependence upon the only one who is worthy to be praised. The one alone who can bring us back into the presence of the Father. And the one whose arms of love and compassion are reaching out to you to reach out to the souls of men. Thank you. Thank you.
Almighty God, our loving Father. What a blessing it has been to uh, sit under your inspiration tonight. Father, uh, truly, we all do need to uh, practice humility in our life. To live in such a uh, great land that uh, you have provided for us. To have the freedoms of the choices that we have and uh, much more gainful employment than other countries. Father, truly, we have been a spoiled people. Forgive us, Lord, for truly we are not worthy, as many are throughout the world, that uh, should sit under such a uh, wonderful message as we've had this night. And Father, uh, even as we said uh, in our song at the opening service, who, uh, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in the air. Lord, we recognize that. We recognize it is you, not any of us. It is those, Heavenly Father, that are pure like the little children. So be with us now, Father, as uh, we go from this place. May that which we have heard this night make a difference in our life, that we will serve you with all of our soul, and that we will do it humbly. Father, we praise you. We thank you for the gift of thy son. As he looked out upon from the cross uh, at the uh, eons of time, that he saw each one of us as he gave himself for us. May we do so for you and him. Lord, we pray that each one, as uh, they travel this night to uh, their places of rest, that uh, they would be blessed with a good sleep. We thank you for the wonderful fellowship that we've shared in. And just pray that uh, we might continue to have thy spirit to minister to us as we complete through the uh, rest of this conference. And Lord, again, we praise you and thank you for we give it all to thee in Jesus' name. Amen.